Okay, this is the political game in civil society in Mexico, Objective 2, about how political participation is represented in Mexico's political culture. And what we're going to get into here are basically the ways that uh, people of Mexico participate in their government, uh, even if they're not necessarily participating in a linkage institution. Uh, maybe they don't necessarily belong to a political party or, or uh, um, are involved in an interest group or even pay that much attention to the media. If they're not involved in linkage institutions, well, what other ways do they participate? Well, if you take a look at letter A here, uh, you really can't talk about participation in Mexico's political history without talking about the patron-client system, which is also known as patronage. Now, uh, uh, looking at letter A on the outline here, A1, you can see uh, I have written there that um, patronage has been a major part of the Mexican political system since the PRI in 1929. Ultimately, it always came down to popularity. Uh, if you supported the elites and you were willing to play the game with them, if you're willing to do what they asked you to do, well, we're not necessarily talking anything illegal, but if you're just willing to grant them support and favors, the more you got in return, particularly when it came to government jobs. If you were a supporter of the PRI, then the PRI made sure you had food, a place to a place to stay, a place to work. The government jobs were the most important aspect of that. Uh, now, because of, of the, the recent changes since 2000, competitive campaigns, elections, and a lot more interest group participation is starting to change the whole idea of the patron-client system uh, in Mexico, but it's kind of tough to do. If you take a look at A2 down there, you can remember that it started with the 19th century caudillos. I mentioned that in the last video the uh, rural revolutionary leaders, but here's one thing I want you to circle and underline on that, the Camarilla. Kids often get confused about the difference between a Caudillo and a Camarilla. Remember, Caudillo is a person, the Camarilla is the network or the system of patronage between the Caudillos and their followers. Now again, until 2000, most government positions were held by PRI supporters uh, in a classic patron clientelist sense. Uh, a vote for the PRI meant jobs, and, and I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse with this, but, but it's, it's worth mentioning a couple times because it is that important. That trend uh, had continued on for 80 years until the election of 2000 uh, when Vicente Fox, a PAN candidate, uh, gets elected to the presidency. However, it's important to remember that uh, patronage is still very important in rural areas today. Uh, again, broken up a bit by uh, urbanization and efforts toward political competition in the cities. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good effort, but it's still creating a, a lack of legitimacy for the Mexican government. Uh, not the easiest thing for them to deal with as they try to become a, a more clean and fair democracy. Now, if you look at uh, letter B here, protest is also very healthy in Mexico, actually, uh, and, and it's done through a process that political scientists would refer to as uh, co-optation. Okay? Now, uh, the Mexican government has often been very, very good at accommodating the demands of its protesters, both uh, on small levels to bigger protests to mass demonstrations, Typically, uh, the Mexican government has been really, really good about accommodating the demands of protesters. Now, this trend starts in 1968 when a uh, student protest became uh, very violent. Uh, 200 protesters ended up dead. Now, this is B1A. Uh, 200 protesters end up dead, and the Mexican government feels like, and I think this is very healthy compared to a lot of governments in the world, they feel like they actually have to do something about it. So uh, a lot of the protesters uh, from that were actually recruited for uh, uh, jobs in the Mexican government. Uh, a lot of student protesters across the board just to show the Mexican people, uh, I don't know if it was an apology, but just to let them know that they are aware of what happened and how bad things were. So a uh, protest in, in, uh, in Mexico has generally been considered very good. Now, there is one group that was offered co-optation, the idea that we'll give you jobs in government uh, 
uh, if, uh, you know, if we can settle down the protests a little bit. And if you remember from the political and economic change lesson, they're located in this region right down here, right on the Guatemalan border. Uh, it's the Zapatista movement. And uh, they haven't always been the most uh, accommodating to the Mexican government. If you remember, the Zapatistas uh, actually start in 1994 uh, down here in uh, Chiapas uh, to uh, basically protest the NAFTA treaty. Uh, and essentially they capture four towns and, uh, and demand jobs, land, housing, food, health, education, independence, uh, all sorts of things. Now the rebellion for the Zapatistas eventually spreads and becomes a major movement. And a lot of people from neighboring regions join into the whole thing. Now, if you remember, the Zapatistas are characterized by wearing the black ski mask across the board, and they're uh, uh, essentially a mystery group. Uh, the, the government reached out to them. They consider this a high level of protest, so the government reached out to them and offered them co-optation. Well, the Zapatistas uh, talked about it. They thought about it. And they ultimately said no. So co-optation, while a good policy in Mexican political participation, hasn't necessarily always worked out uh, as, uh, I guess, an apology method for the government. Now, moving on to voter behavior, letter C on the outline. Again, please remember that uh, the PRI, prior to 1990, uh, dominated uh, um, uh, Mexican politics and there was patronage on all levels. That continues through the 90s a little bit and gradually comes to somewhat of a stop with the 2000 election of Vicente Fox. But nonetheless, uh, voting rates are uh, very high in Mexican elections. And uh, election days are, are generally considered an event to celebrate. They're pretty festive, a lot of food, a lot of entertainment for political supporters. And traditionally, uh, again, it's changing recently, but traditionally high levels of corruption with what are called tacos. And you probably ought to underline that. It's letter C, 1C. Uh, tacos in uh, uh, Mexican politics are generally referred to as stuffed ballot boxes. Uh, people voting twice, uh, people bribing other people to vote the way they want to, just essentially uh, illegally stuffing the ballot box. Uh, now, again, other parties have existed since 1930, but have no chance at, at the presidency, or haven't until 2000. So the PRI has really benefited from the whole uh, political tacos concept. Since 1990, voting rates have gone up, but political corruption does still exist. Now, again, just a general reminder of who tends to support who. Well, the PAN... Uh, is uh, the National Action Party, is usually supported in the North. Most of the time in these regions right up here. Now remember that PAN candidates are generally supported by people who have uh, higher education, uh, usually more urban, uh, you know, that type of thing. PRI, on the other hand, isn't really relegated to one particular region. Uh, you probably could say the south, but it's mostly about rural areas all over Mexico. Uh, PRI, again, is lower income people, uh, usually lower education level. But when you take a look, uh, the cities generally support uh, PAN. There's a lot of open regional areas with no major cities in Mexico, and so that gives the PRI some fairly strong political bases, basis, even though they're... Uh, there, there's smaller population in these general areas. Now, this slide I'm bringing up just for the supplemental reading that goes on with Objective 2. When they're talking about the protests in that reading, they're talking about this region right here, okay? Which basically, um, I don't know how to pronounce that well, so I'm just saying this region right here. Uh, but nonetheless, what happens over there is kind of an offshoot of the Zap Zapatista movement which had taken place in Chiapas. Uh, uh, the Zapatista movement and other forms of protest had made their way this way. So when you do the supplemental reads on that, 
they're talking about this general area right here. Okay, there is no Objective 3 video because it's very, very short. So uh, just take a look at the outline on Objective 3. It's really only two things, and they're pretty self-explanatory. So if there are any questions, just let me know in class. Thanks for listening.